Hello guys, hello family, hello friends. This is Dr. T and welcome to Clinical Medicine with Dr. T. So guys, in this video, I want us to talk about the cardiac axis. The cardiac axis. So, uh, after you have placed your leads, I would encourage you guys to actually watch uh, that video first before you come to this video where I talk about the correct placement of leads and um, and I also try to explain what does it mean to have a 12 lead ECG when you only place um, 10 electrodes on a patient so I discuss it there, I talk about the Enthoven's triangle and uh, so please, before you, you come to this one, just make sure that you watch that video first. So now let's say you have placed your leads nicely and you have, uh, the machine has given you a tracing, an ECG. So you've got your pattern now. So now when it comes to interpretation, what is the approach? So what you want to do is to always start with these three things that I'm going to mention. I'm not going to talk about the calibration. It's important to look at it, but not about the interpretation or the actual interpretation of the, um, of the ECG. So the first thing that you need to look at is the, 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 the rhythm. So look at the rhythm. I'm going to show you guys how to look at the rhythm, how to determine the, the rhythm. But decide if it's regular or irregular. Decide if it's regular or irregular. There's a reason why I say that, that should be your first step because I know many people want to start with the rate. And then after they figured out the rate, they move on to the rhythm. But the problem with that is if you figure out the rate and then you figure out the rhythm last, what's going to happen is that you're going to use wrong methods of figuring the, the rate. You're going to use wrong method. What do I mean by that? This is what I mean. There are methods of figuring the heart rate that are only correct if you use them when the heart rate is regular. And then there are methods that you can only use them when the heart rate is irregular. So now, if you've got an irregular heart rate and then you use the methods that you would use in a regular heart rate, you're going to get wrong, wrong readings. We are going to talk about the methods. There's a 1,500 method, then there's a 300 um, um, method or third box method. So we're going to talk about those. Listen, the methods that are correct for a regular heart rate is your 1,500 and your 300. So now if you use the 300 method and then you figure out a heart rate of a, a, an irregular heart rate, you're going to get a wrong reading. So that's what I'm trying to say. There are methods that are only correct if you use them when the heart is irregular and there, and there are those that are only correct when you use them if the heart rate is regular. Anyways. The rhythm, the rate, and the axis. Figure out the axis. So these are the three things that you must start with before you can worry about the P waves, morphology, how tall they are, how wide they are, the PR, URS, ST, the depressed, the elevated, blah, blah. These are the things that you must figure out first. 
Okay. So the topic of that we're gonna be focusing on this video is the the axis. What is the axis? Or the cardiac axis. If we have our heart right here, it's an ugly heart, eh? So if we have our heart right here, and then this is our this is our left ventricle, right ventricle, left atrium, right atrium. That's our heart. And we have got our conduction system there. AV, uh, SA node, AV node, SA node, AV node, bundle of keys, uh, left bundle, uh, bundle branch, right bundle branch, kg fibers. So that's what we have. And we also know that action potentials, they move from the right atrium to the left atrium via the, the Bachmann's um, bundle and they travel or get transmitted to the AV node via the internodal fibers as a node AV node internodal Here is bundle. Um, Bachmann's branch. Um, left bundle branch. Right. And the branch and the candy fibers. So this is what we know, right? So we know that action potential is generated normally from the SA node. To the AV node going down bundle of keys, the right and the left bundle branch. So the direction of the cross, I'm saying cross because there are other small movements. Um, there are other small uh, action potentials that move in other directions, but the majority or the cross movement of action potentials. In a heart, they move this direction. They move this direction. That's the normal direction the current moves in the heart. It's a downward left direction. Downward left direction. So that's what the cardiac axis is all about. It's it determines. It tells us about the gross direction of the action potentials in the heart. Which direction is the gross movement of electrical impulses? Which direction is it facing or which direction is it going towards? Right? Now, why is it like that? One of the reasons is because the i may say one of the factors that determines the gross movement or the gross direction of the action potentials in the heart is this muscle here this muscle is quite a thick muscle and we know this muscle is 
thicker than this muscle. So the muscle, the cardiomyocytes, there are numerous cardiomyocytes. There's, there are a lot of cardiomyocytes on the left ventricle compared to the right. And they are thicker, they are stronger. The reason is that the left ventricle has got to pump blood into the systemic circulation, which is a longer distance compared to the right ventricle, which has got to pump blood just next door. So the, the lungs are just next door to the heart. So they don't have to be strong, they don't have to be thick, they don't have to be big to actually um, make sure that the lungs, they get the blood because it's very close. But imagine this ventricle has got to pump blood to the toe. So it must be stronger and more thicker to be able to, to do that. So now because of that, a lot of action potential is generated on the left ventricle. So the left ventricle determines the amount in the direction of the, of the, the impulses in the heart because it has got more cardiomyocytes they are bigger they are thicker they are much more stronger and there's a lot of action potentials that take place there's a lot of transmission that takes place then so that's why the axis is more towards the left ventricle right that's the normal okay now that we have that the cardiac axis, when you are given a strip to figure it out, one thing that you must do, especially when you are starting to interpret, you must draw a quadrant. Let me just say, There are two methods of figuring out the cardiac axis. The first method is the two lead method, also called the quadrant method. Then the second method is a three lead method. The easiest that we're going to be talking about is the two lead. It's the easiest one. So, there are times where they will tell you that the cardiac axis is, is deviated to the left or is deviated to the right or it's an extreme deviation. So, those are the terminologies that uh, we're going to get to and try to understand what does it mean to have a right axis deviation or a left axis deviation or an extreme axis deviation. What is a normal um, cardiac axis? That's what we are trying to get to. We are going to go back, talk about the rhythm, talk about the rate. I just felt, let me just do the exits now. So when you use the two, so we're going to be using the two lead method in this case. So we're going to be focusing on the two lead method, the two lead method which is very easy. I use it. This is the one that I use. It's easy. It's easy to explain this to understand. So that the three lead is very complicated. It's not very complicated, but the easiest one is the two lead. So which means in this method, we use two leads to actually figure out the cardiac axis. Like I said, the cardiac axis is the direction, the cross direction of the movement of action potentials which side are they facing, which side is the current facing most of the, or the overall direction of the action potentials, which side are they like facing or going towards. So the two lead, is, uh, the two lead method uses lead one, this is what you must memorize, uses lead one and AVF. What 
other things that you look at in those two leads that will help you to figure out the cardiac axis. You look at the QRS complex. So you look at the QRS complex on both of those leads. Remember guys, on an ECG, there are times where you see flat line, a flat line. A flat line means that it's an isoelectric line. There isn't much happening there. But when you get a movement away from the isoelectric line, and that movement goes above the um, isoelectric line, that's called a positive deflection. But if it goes below, it's called a negative deflection. So what I want you to get to understand here is that what's a positive deflection, what is negative deflection. So a positive deflection is above the isoelectric line and the negative deflection is below the isoelectric line. So the isoelectric line is the flat, um, is a flat line like that one, right? So you look at the QRS complex You look at the QRS complex, you first look at lead one, you say, okay, is the deflection in lead one a positive deflection or a negative deflection? Then you move on to AVF, is it a positive deflection or a negative deflection? You use the QRS, then I repeat, you use the QRS complex. Okay, let's go back to our quadrant. So on the quadrant, what you must just memorize is that right here you've got your 0 degrees, right here you've got your minus 180 degrees, right here you've got your positive uh, 90 degrees, right here you've got your negative 90 degrees. 0 degrees corresponds with lead 1 and um, positive 90 corresponds with, uh, let me just say, the horizontal plane or the, um, the x-axis corresponds with lead uh, 1 and the y-axis corresponds with AVF, right? So, this side is the positive side. And then this side is the negative. Then this is AV, this line is AVF, below this line is the positive AVF, and then above it's a negative AVF. Very important, right? And somewhere here, you have a negative 30 degrees. And right here, you have a, a positive 60 degrees. I'm not going to get into the detail, because, uh, I mean, for the... Cardiac axis, to figure it out, you use limb leads, only limb leads, not your chest leads or your precordial leads. But I'm not going to put the other limb leads there. I don't want it to be, I don't want that, that diagram to be too busy, right? I don't, like, I don't want it to be too busy. So that you can see things nicely and clearly. So, when you look at, so that's, what, that's the diagram that you must have in your mind. Be able to draw it, it's going to help you. So now, let's say you are given an ECG, then they ask you what's the cardiac um, axis. Like I said, the cardiac axis can either be the cardiac axis can either be you can either get a normal cardiac axis. Or you can get abnormalities. And abnormalities can be a right axis deviation, a left axis deviation, or an extreme extreme axis deviation. 
But what are those? One thing that you must memorize is that anything that falls from minus 32 plus 90 is normal. This is normal. If you can look at the direction, we said the direction is towards it's down and, and, and towards the left side. So if it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here, it's towards the it's towards the it's down and out. So as long as it's in the in, in the in those um so it's regarded as normal as long as it's between so the, the normal cardiac axis is between minus 30 to plus 90 degrees. That's a normal cardiac axis. Right? Anything that is above minus 30 and less than minus 90, which is here. That one is called a left axis deviation. So, a left axis deviation is minus 30 to minus 90 degrees. So it's easier to have that quadrant in your mind when you're answering this kind of question. Because you know exactly where minus 30 to minus 90, where that falls. Anything that is between Plus 92 minus uh, 80 like that is regarded as a right axis deviation. Right axis deviation. You don't want a deviated cardiac axis, you want it to be normal. So when there's a deviation, there's an abnormality, which means now the gross direction of the electrical impulses has changed. So now it means for a left axis deviation, it means now your the current is now going like that, is facing upwards and to the to, to, to the um, to the left, it's going like that. When there's a right axis deviation, it means now instead of having the gross movement of electricity uh, or action potentials facing that direction, now it's towards this direction. That's a right axis. When it's an extreme, it's facing up there. So, so this is an extreme axis deviation. So an extreme is between minus 90, minus 180, right? This is where we are. So as long as you have got this and you understand it, you can actually now start entertaining um, ECG strips and trying to figure out the cardiac axis. So let's move into it. So let's say now I get a strip. So what do you do when you get a strip? You get a strip, you look at lead one and lead, and, and, and lead A, B, F. Let's say now in lead one, you look at the QRS and you find that, okay, it's positive. If it's positive, it means now you are dealing with this because positive lead one is this line. So it means now you are dealing with this side. I don't know, I can't remember the word to, uh, that I can use now to call this. But you are dealing, it can either your 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 axis can either be in this quadrant or in this quadrant. But you don't know where exactly, but you just know it can either be this quadrant or this quadrant because all you know is that your QRS in lead one is on the positive, right? But now to answer to or to complete this assessment of the axis, look at AVF. Let's say in AVF you also find that it's positive. 
you've got a positive deflection there as well. So it's positive and it's positive. So positive AVF is down towards the, the 90. So which means the, the, the axis of that patient, that strip is in this quadrant, which is a normal axis. So normal axis, there's no deviation, it's a normal axis. Take another example. Let's say lead one is, let's say it's positive again. It's positive. But AVF, the QRS there, the deflection is negative. So if it's positive for lead one and negative for AVF, so you are dealing with this quadrant. You are dealing with this quadrant. Now, remember in this quadrant, if it's between uh, zero degrees to minus, it's still normal. It's still normal, but once it gets to above minus 30 to 90, then that's when you can say now it's a left axis deviation. So which means now you for this this particular um, combination, you're gonna need another method to actually figure out exactly is it below the 30 or is it above the 30, right? Take another example. Say lead one, you have a negative deflection, and AVF you also have got a negative deflection of the QRS. So negative for lead one is this side, and the negative for AVF is up here. So which sorry, which means this is where you are. Your patient is got an extreme exit deviation. Take another example. Say lead one has got a negative deflection, but AVF has got a positive deflection. So, so lead one positive deflection, so this line, AVF positive deflection. So I think we've done this. So you are somewhere here. So it's positive, but so you are somewhere here. I don't know what other combination I haven't uh, put. Positive, positive, negative, negative, negative. Oh, let's say you've got. Um, a negative and a positive. We have that positive and a negative. No, we have. I think we've we've done all of them. But anyways, so the most important thing is that you look at your um your lead lead one in AVF. Look at your QRS. Are they positively deflected or negatively deflected? If they are, if like I was saying, if lead one is positive, then it means you're dealing with this line. Then now to decide where exactly, then you need the second, you need the AVF to decide where exactly, which quadrant is the, is the, is the axis, right? Um, yeah. So now, what does this mean to you? There are so many causes of this, né? but I'm just going to mention one. A left axis deviation, like, like I said earlier, that what determines one of the major factors that determines the direction of flow is the thick muscle here. Now, let's say for some reason, this muscle gets thicker and thicker and thicker. Remember, we are born with a thick left ventricular muscles or muscle. So that's why we have a normal axis pointing towards the, the bigger muscle. But now let's say this muscle gets sick and it becomes bigger, more bigger. So now it's going to take this deviation towards that side up until this patient gets a left axis deviation, which means right a left hypertrophy or the enlargement of the left ventricle can give you or does give you a left axis deviation. Oh, let's say this muscle decided that I also want to grow and it grows and grows and becomes thicker and thicker and thicker up until it gets thicker than this side. So the normal axis which is facing that direction will be pulled towards this direction and you end up having a right axis deviation. And if things get worse, it's going to keep going and keep going and until you get an extreme excess deviation. I have seen a lot of this, especially with the core pulmonary patient. 
like just on Friday, I saw two that had had a, one had a, a, a right axis deviation and the other had an extreme axis deviation, right? So I think we're gonna leave it there, guys. We're gonna leave it there. I hope you enjoyed this um, part of the series. Thank you, and please comment, like, share, and uh, yeah, thank you.